Hi from our respective locations, I'm MOC at DSV's Public Information Associate, Megan Owens, and this is Momentum, a live stream event produced by our coalition connecting advocates across our state. Before we get started, uh, I just wanted to remind folks we have moved our previously recorded webcast format to be live. So this event will be recorded and will be posted on YouTube and also as a podcast so that folks who couldn't attend live can still have an opportunity to watch or listen um, to the content. And our Momentum Live will take place on the last Friday of every month at 12 p.m. Central Time. So for today's event, we will be speaking with Angela Brodnax, the Prevention Education and Training Manager at YWCA St. Louis, about the racial justice book club she started and her broader prevention work. So for the folks who are joining us live, feel free to ask any questions or share any comments. However, there is a short delay between the Zoom and the Facebook Live. We do have coalition staff who are helping to moderate during the live, but if you have any questions that aren't answered during the live, feel free to reach out directly to MOCA DSV by phone or email. And then also staff will address any comments or questions directly on Facebook as needed um, after the live is over. So thank you so much for joining us, Angela. We're excited to have you on Momentum. Um, so I just wanna get a quick introduction from you and just tell folks about who you are and what your work is. Sure, absolutely. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Angela. As you said, I am um, the Prevention Education and Training Manager for YWCA Metro St. Louis. Um, a lot of my work is around violence prevention, um, primarily sexual violence and domestic violence. Um, I do a lot of bystander trainings out in the community um, and then internal training for our advocates here at the agency. Um, I do want to talk about the book club. I'm super excited about uh, sharing how that got started. Um, Last year, I worked with um, St. Louis County Library uh, around sexual violence and domestic violence and hosted a How to Help workshop. Um, it was virtual, online. It really focused on um, helping friends and family of those folks who have experienced sexual or domestic violence learn how to best help those folks that they care about. Um, and at that time, I worked with the librarian there and talked a little bit about the YWCA and our mission. So we have a really huge mission here at the Y. Um, we are dedicated to eliminating racism empowering women and promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. And so really after talking with her about um, the mission and the work at the YWCA, um, we were asked to host a 21 day racial equity challenge. So last year we had a really, um, really great turnout with the St. Louis County Library for that 21 day racial equity challenge. And it was primarily focused on um, health equity and looking at racism as a public health crisis. Um, and after that challenge ended, we got a lot of feedback from participants that they were still interested in learning more about social justice issues, um, wanting to still stay engaged around these types of issues and um, to feel more confident about being part of that social change. So um, working with the librarian there, I was uh, introduced to two other librarians who volunteered to work with me on a social justice book club. Um, and so the three of us, we work together once a month. We meet on the first Mondays um, online at uh, 7 p.m. Uh, and every month we discuss a new book, right? Um, our very first book was uh, The Color Purple um, by Alice Walker. And we were really excited about starting with this book because it covered so much of the uh, intersections, um, racism, sexism, sexuality, colorism. Um, and then also um, there is themes of domestic and sexual violence. So that was a really great place for us to start. Um, and we've been moving strong since then, so. That's so exciting. Yeah. I love to hear about this partnership and how it was developed with the St. Louis County Library and you just originally starting out with a topic about intimate partner violence and sexual violence and right. then really moving into the broader issues that connect um, to IPV, DVSV. And so I think that's a really important thing to think about is how we connect those issues together. Do you mind talking a little bit more about how you kind of shared that message with folks who maybe are really new to those topics? Sure. So um, starting with the 21 day racial equity challenge, it's um, really a 21 days worth of small challenges. So they range anywhere from things that'll take you five minutes to things that might take you an hour. Um, and we do um, kind of micro lessons around different definitions and social justice issues, um, really getting people in the spaces to be comfortable talking about these things. Um, and so we continue that kind of through the book club. So every month we pick a book um, and at the beginning of our sessions, uh, we do a mini lesson. So we do a mini lesson around um, a certain topic, try to keep it related to the book we're reading and um, have some discussion there. And then we really talk about those themes throughout the the book we've read and um, how we can take that information and share it outside of book club. That is awesome. 
And I love to hear that piece about, you know, it can take five minutes, minutes to an hour of just really making it accessible for folks who are like, I'm so busy. Uh, I'm sure you know that as working at a direct um, service agency, how often your time just disappears. And so that five minutes um, gives someone a chance to engage with this really important stuff within their own schedule and without kind of becoming overwhelming. Um, I'd love to hear about maybe either a story you have to share about the book club that kind of really solidified what makes you so excited about this project or what you think this project does for the community. No, absolutely. So um, my favorite story about the book club is actually uh, the second book we read, which is um, The Last Children of Mill Creek by Vivian Gibson. Um, for those folks who don't know what Mill Creek is, that's a neighborhood in St. Louis, actually, that um, uh, predominantly Black neighborhood in St. Louis that was pretty much erased um, under the guise of urban revitalization. Um, and during this time, many Black families were displaced or moved to housing projects um, that didn't allow men um, to move into those places, meaning that the intentional separation of those families, right? Um, we were lucky enough at Book Club to have uh, Miss Gibson join us, the author of that book, um, who lives in St. Louis still, um, joined us for that discussion and was able to uh, tell us some about our writing process, but then also give us um, her accounts from being a child that grew up in Mill Creek, in the Mill Creek area. Um, and she's been doing a lot of work on unerasing that neighborhood, um, letting people know the history of the place where we live and some of the things that have happened here. And um, it was really exciting to have her just show up and the author of the book share with us. That is so special. And I'm just imagining how wonderful it would be to actually get to hear directly from not only an author, but someone who really lived through these really important and devastating experiences and able to share that with us now. And I think it also points to the fact that like, this is not history in the sense of like this happened hundreds of years ago. This is very recent. And also the way that history continues to impact us regardless of how long ago it was. Can you speak a little bit more about how some of these issues really connect with prevention and prevention work that you're doing? Oh, absolutely. So um, like I said, my focus generally for prevention piece is really around violence prevention. Um, and so often we're talking about um, communities of color who are disproportionately affected by those things. So um, we do know that black women are more likely than any other group to be murdered by an intimate partner, right? And so these are issues that we bring up when we're talking about sexual and domestic violence always that there is um, no type of oppression that exists in its own on its own by itself. So all of these things do intersect. Um, and so we're always looking at ways to really move forward through those things and then connecting the dots and seeing how these things do impact people that we care about, people that we know. Um, so really looking at that piece and then making it, like you said, accessible to folks. The library has been a great resource because most people can have access to the local library. Um, another thing we do in the book club is we make sure to only pick books that the library has lots of copies of. So whether digital copies or audio copies or physical copies, we pick books that people can actually access. That's phenomenal. That's something that I think is, I've been in book clubs before where it was almost impossible for me to actually get the book. Sure. Um, and so that's a huge thing too for folks to be able to have access, regardless of if they need like a large print book or if they need audio, there's an option for them. And that's, it's really amazing to hear that you all are keeping those considerations in mind as you're doing that project. Um, I also want to kind of go back to what you said about the intersections. And I think that's something that we can kind of put to the side when we think about a lot of overarching domestic and sexual violence work, whether it's prevention or whether it's, you know, our right now we're trying to act, interact with survivors, we end up treating everybody exactly the same, but in that we end up losing folks, folks who are, like you said, at a much higher likelihood to experience violence or have unique situations or have less protective factors than other folks. And so I wonder if you could speak a little bit to how you kind of specifically address some of those things with folks who maybe really aren't familiar with those intersections and kind of want to treat everything, every kind of domestic and sexual violence is exactly the same, regardless of those kind of other mitigating factors. Absolutely. So, um, so I am a prevention education specialist, but in addition to that, I do a lot of internal training. So with our advocates that work for the Y. Um, so in addition to all of our training and onboarding requirements, every new hire that works for our Women's Resource Center also receives specialized training and working with survivors of color specifically. Um, so we, in those trainings, we talk about things like um, access to systems, right? Um, so when it comes to sexual and domestic violence, we are often um, helping people 
navigate through these systems, whether it be the medical systems or law enforcement. And um, often those systems are not have not been helpful to many people. And so recognizing that as we advocate for people that those systems may not have been made for them and might have his historically abused them, right? And so really understanding those dynamics that uh, there are differences sometimes and ignoring those differences um, doesn't help anyone. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And I love that you talked about how those systems are not always built for people or have historically not helped certain groups of people in the way they're supposed to. And I think that's something we see a lot with survivors who are like, when a lot of our options are, you know, hospital, medical facility, or law enforcement, folks are like, I've had bad experiences with both of these. What are my options? How do I actually address what's going on? And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to how you kind of work through that with maybe folks who really aren't understanding who are new advocates maybe who don't really understand those intersections and how you help them kind of problem solve around those for those survivors who really want to work outside of those two systems. Sure, absolutely. So one of the things we talk about is um, a lot of internal work that we have to do within ourselves, right? So not figuring out something just because you've met someone of a certain race or certain identity for the first time. That's not when you want to be learning how to work with someone that's different than you. So um, one of the things I do is give little tips. So again, with the mini lessons, how can I do things in my everyday life that make me mindful of people who are different than I am and um, of the world around me? And so we do that. Um, throughout all of our conversations with the agency, but specifically with uh, working with survivors of color training, um, I use a historical context. So I kind of go way back on some of the things and how we um, have historically thought about certain groups of people, right? And how we've been socialized to think about certain groups of people and how that does make some folks, depending on their identity, um, more likely to be abused by other people, right? Or by intimate partners or, um, experience sexual violence. And so bringing up those things and how we talk about them within certain communities and the language we use is all very, very important. And so we're always bringing those things up and then giving um, our advocates an opportunity to talk with each other and to talk, speak with me and to really um, try and get rid of the uncomfortable feelings, right? Because we're just going to have to learn to get uncomfortable sometimes. Yeah. No, I love, I, there's so many things that you said that just kind of got my brain going. But I love when you're talking about it's okay to be uncomfortable. And like, sometimes that is really, that's a, kind of where the learning happens. Like, right. you know, as humans, we're not going to know everything. And so being able to be uncomfortable with being in this, being comfortable, being uncomfortable, I guess. Yes, and absolutely. To learn. And I also really like that you talked about how internal work is one of the important first steps, because you're absolutely right that how are we to be able to do our work externally if we haven't done it internally? and ensure that we're actually offering survivors the services they need. Um, and that requires a lot of unlearning because we learn things certain ways or our own experiences have kind of colored the way that we see the world. And so being able to do that internal work is so important. Absolutely. Um, do you mind sharing a little bit about how, you know, maybe how you get, you don't have to get too much into your mini lessons. I don't want you to give away your training, but um, how, what, can you give me an example of one of the many lessons you've done, something that folks could do at home if they're trying to get you know, started or continue their own internal work? Gotcha. No, of course. So um, one of the things, so most recently, the micro lesson we used was on microaggressions. Um, so really talking about that um, outside of just hearing um, a few people's stories, right? So putting it um, with all different types of identities, microaggressions that certain people feel on a daily basis um, and how those um, things that seem small add up to big things, right? Um, and so really one of the things that I try to do is we do the lesson one way um, and then we open it up for questions. And then sometimes I find myself um, reteaching the lesson in a different way, right? To make sure everyone is um, kind of on the same page. And um, before any lesson, like you said about being um, comfortable with getting uncomfortable, we have um, kind of group norms where we talk about that. So it's okay for us to be uncomfortable for a little bit. And when we are, that's actually us growing. And sometimes there is, um, sometimes there can be pushback between groups that uh, just don't understand each other. And so really making the space to do that um, has been really the most helpful thing so far. That is awesome. Yeah. I love that you start the meetings with the framing of like, let's talk about our norms, because I think it kind of sets the tone for how the conversation conversation right. can go um, and also provides people an opportunity to like recenter themselves in those moments of like, okay, I, I'm not comfortable with this, but let's talk about why, or let me think about why or journal about it or something um, to really kind of delve into that more. So I love that framing because I think that's something that a lot of people 
in our field, but also other fields are really experiencing right now is trying to figure out how to address topics that maybe we've never addressed before or historically have been ignored in the DBSB movement. You know, I think it's pretty common for us to kind of treat every solution as the exact same for every single survivor. That really isn't the case. And so it's kind of delving into that conversation can be difficult for folks. Sure, um, sure. So I love the work that you all are doing with that. It's amazing. Yeah. No, absolutely. One of the um, other things you just made me think of is uh, so talking about being uncomfortable in those spaces, but also recognizing that um, we all are at different levels of learning, right? Um, however, with the Social Justice Book Club, everyone signed up for the jo Social Justice Book Club knowing that it was a Social Justice Book Club. So even if they're at a very beginning stage level, we're all kind of, we have that one thing in common, right? We're all here because we wanna make some kind of social change. Um, so just acknowledging that we are on the same page, uh, at least in that regard, makes it much easier to have those conversations and start to get on the same page in other regards. Um, so we do try and bring that up often. Another thing I try to bring up often is, um, so even with internally with training and um, some of our community partners I work with, um, always talking about the privilege we have to have these conversations, right? Um, and that's similar to DV and SV work. So we, if we're all advocates in the same room, we're privileged to be able to talk about all those dynamics. Most people don't get those kind of lessons. That's something you have to go out and seek. Uh, we're not usually taught that growing up. We don't typically see those things on TV or in media. And so um, we just have to acknowledge that we are all in different spaces, but that we do have a collective goal of making some kind of social change. Yeah, definitely. And I love also, again, framing the conversation from the beginning as like, we all have the same thing in common. We are right. here, whether it's for the social justice book club or whether it's working at a domestic sexual violence agency, we all have the same goals. So let's start with that. And I love that. Um, just to get back to the, the book club, because I'm so interested in this, but can you tell me a little bit more about maybe some successes from the book club, whether it was like somebody who, this is a brand new for them and kind of what they got out of it or anything you want to share around some experiences that really stood out to you about participants in the book club? Sure. Um, we've had a couple of aha moments in the book club that have been really cool. So uh, that I hadn't thought about a certain thing in a certain way until just now as we were discussing this book. Um, so we did our first book I mentioned was The Color Purple. Um, that book is one that um, myself and the librarians chose to start off with because of all of those intersections. Um, several people in the group had already read the book right before and so they're reading it for maybe a second or a third time and some folks reading it for the very first time and us just really um, finding that although we have a pretty diverse group of people in the social justice book club, we all found something that we could relate to within at least one of the characters in the book, right? So there's a character in that book that you can find yourself relating to. Um, and that was pretty true for almost everyone in the group. So that was kind of an aha moment for us to go, oh yeah, we're all represented here in some kind of way, shape or form. That's amazing. Yeah, I think that's something that we kind of tend to forget about is like how important the representation is in this, this stuff that we're consuming. And so being able to have that as the very first book, like it really sets a tone for the rest of the book club too, of just like, yes, yeah. we're all, this is all, this is all related to us personally, but also to people we care about, our communities, and also having the St. Louis specific book as the next one also just really kind of, this is, a, this is happening in your community and the history of your community. And I mean, like, I think that stuff is really impactful. I read the book specifically about um, St. Louis stuff going on and how that really was like oh this is not just like in the world this is at home this is in my bed. sure that was another thing even with the last children of mill creek there was there were people in the group who were born and raised in st louis that did not know mill creek was a neighborhood that existed um and i am not a st louis native so i've not always lived here but i had to go pull up a map and go oh this is where that neighborhood used to be um and that was kind of cool to see it you know at home in your own backyard yeah and it is also wild how you know, the, something that is, if you were born and raised here, you can still know so little about some of the history of your city and how stuff projects like what you're doing is so important to helping people, you know, know about their city, but also about the issues that impact their neighbors. So, right. This kind of switching gears a little bit. I'd love to know about how you kind of, I know you talked about developing the partnership with St. Louis public libraries from the, um, like the course you did first off about domestic sexual violence. Can yeah, you talk sure, a little bit sure. more about developing that partnership and maybe you know tips for folks who are looking to develop a broader partnership like that too? Oh yeah, sure. Um, so really we started the, the relationship um, in April of last year, um, uh, Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, 
And so uh, the librarian there asked if we could really just Googled us and asked if we could come do some kind of how to help for helping people with uh, work with survivors, right? And um, a how to help workshop is something that the Y has always done. So we have workshops that for family and friends of those who experience uh, some type of violence. And we talk a lot about those dynamics and then also what kind of language to use when you're working with someone, how to make sure we're not victim blaming. And so the library was able to give us this really cool platform, you know, where we can reach a lot of people um, at one time. And so that was uh, really how we started um, with the how to help workshops. Um, and with the pandemic coming, um, it was so much easier for us to grasp a, or to grasp a bigger audience um, because we were virtual at that time. And so really just kind of sticking with that, how to help. Um, and it gave us a chance to share some of the work that we've always done here at the Y. So that was a pretty cool uh, partnership. And we've just kind of grown out of that. And uh, I have found that librarians are some of the coolest people to work with. And so that's been a fun part for me too. I love that. Yeah, as a kid who loved to read, I was friends with all my librarians, and so I love all the librarian love. Um, yes. Very important resource, and also just it makes things more accessible to folks, and I love that you talked about, like, you know, people come to our workshop. We do this workshop for a long time, but how different it is for an audience who maybe really isn't used to that or isn't necessarily specifically seeking out that. Um, can still get access to that really important. Stuff, so. Yeah, we know that. So victim survivors, they don't reach out to us first. They don't reach out to law enforcement first. They reach out to family and friends first. And so that's who we need to reach, those people. Um, that first response to a, to a survivor really determines how they move forward after an assault or after an experience of violence. Yeah, and just that, you know, working with folks, they're able to support kind of that prevention work. If people are able to get access to help early on, it can really make a difference in like their long, their, you know, their path moving forward or how they're able to, you know, adjust after something horrible like this happens to them. Absolutely. Awesome. And then a lot of, I'm going to go back to prevention a little bit, but this is kind of a question you might have heard a lot. I've heard it a lot about like, how do we actually spend time on prevention when we have really limited resources? And it feels like, well, right now I need to take care of the survivors that need help right now. And so how do you kind of talk through that with folks? Oh, absolutely. So um, that is a hard thing to balance, right? Um, it's also much easier to find funding for the direct service and not for prevention, right? But it is so yeah. important. And I think um, the more people we reach, again, the... I mentioned earlier the privilege of sitting in these spaces and sometimes advocates forget because we sit in these spaces often that a lot of people haven't had these conversations. And so having these conversations as often as possible with as many folks as possible, I think is really important. And then um, again, hitting those, those the regular person out there, they, they have family members, they have friends. Um, we know the numbers, one in four is not a very small number. So we, we know the numbers out there. We just have to keep reaching as many people as possible. Yeah, definitely. And I know that um, that can be kind of frustrating for folks of like, well, I really want to work on prevention, but I have these things to do in the moment. And so for programs, um, can you talk a little bit more about how you kind of talk about or encourage like infusing prevention into your other work? Absolutely. So um, one of the unique things about uh, the YWCA in, uh, in St. Louis is our 24-hour uh, response to sexual assaults in uh, St. Louis City and County. Um, that's where we, we show up at the emergency rooms or the police stations anytime anyone's experienced an assault. Um, so as part of the uh, training for that, uh, for our volunteers that respond out. Um, it's a lot of extensive training, but we also offer that that training to other folks in the community, other folks that might interact with these people. So law enforcement agencies is a big one for us. Um, that is a place we try to get into as often as possible to do DV and SV trainings here, um, because our advocates are not the only person in the room with that survivor when we respond out. There's a nurse there, there may be a doctor there, sometimes there's a police officer there. Um, so working with our community partners has been really, really big for us and making sure that we all are kind of speaking the same language. Yeah, definitely. Just having those community partnerships already is a piece of prevention work and being able to work with folks, whether it's before something happens and that like some agencies will work with law enforcement who are in training so they can help them kind of get that language before they are even in front of a survivor. And same with people who are working with same nurses or other nurses who might be interacting. So that's such an important thing. And I think St. Louis has a lot of networks Yes. And that's combined advocates and related fields together, which I think is a really important thing. And a lot of communities have those too. I'm kind of being speaking outside of this because I'm here, but I think it's very, um, very cool how 
people don't realize maybe some of the work they're doing right now is part of prevention. Oh, absolutely. Yep. Definitely. Yep. So I'd love to just hear a little bit more about how you um, really bring more folks together in some of these spaces when it maybe is a little difficult. I know you mentioned that part of it is like social justice book club. People are excited about that. Like they sign up for that for a reason, but it means other spaces for folks who this is brand new to them. Maybe it's a training they have to do for their job and how you kind of bring those folks into those, those groups. Sure, absolutely. Um, so a lot of different ways, anytime we go out and do any kind of pre presentations in the community, of course, we're um, putting our name out there and also explaining what other kinds of trainings and um, programs and services we have. Um, one of our coolest prevention programs, I think, is um, it's called SHADE, that stands for Sexual Health and Disability Education. Mm. And that's a program that I think is unique to us in this area, um, where we offer individual and small group classes on things like uh, friendships, relationships, dating, and sexuality for folks with developmental disabilities. So again, a group that we know is um, disproportionately impacted by violence, but who we tend to um, not, not talk to or not talk about in these regards, right? And so working with those individuals um, to educate them on some of those things has been a really cool piece of prevention that's not um, so much going out and doing lectures and workshops. Um, so I think that's one of our, our cooler uh, programs that we have here. Um, and then another thing we do um, is just healthy relationships, right? So not getting into the violent, sexual violence, the domestic violence uh, dynamics, but really just talking about healthy relationships, um, not just romantic ones, but relationships with, with anyone, right? How do we maintain those um, healthy boundaries and really teaching people um, and young people from an early age about those things as part of the uh, prevention work? Absolutely. And I really love that you talked about, it doesn't necessarily have to be talking about violence yet. And I think that's such an important thing because when we're working with, for example, young kids, we can talk about things related to consent without having to be about sexually explicit content or about violence. It can really be focused on, you know, when you want to hug your friends, like consent around that and how kind of getting those messages started at an early age can really help people have that autonomy and develop their own right. boundaries and really know themselves and know what makes them feel comfortable and learn to trust themselves. And I think that both those like programs sound amazing because um, we do tend to leave a lot of groups out sure, and, sure. you know, act like our exact kind of training that we're doing would just go for everybody. Right, right. Have different means depending on their own, you know, other identities that they have. So, Absolutely. That's amazing. Very cool. Yeah. I love that. Um, so I wanted to ask you also about how folks could support your work or how they could support the book club or join the book club if that's an option. Yeah, absolutely. So the book club is, um, you can join the book club. Um, you don't have to show up every month if you don't want to, if there's a certain book you're interested in, but it's super easy. You go to the St. Louis County Library uh, website um, under events and classes, click adult programs, and then just type in social justice, it'll pop up. Um, we meet once a month. Our next meeting is March 7th, and we'll be talking about the book um, Evicted. So really looking at poverty and housing there. Um, that's another thing that the, the YWC is always kind of have been in is housing for for women so um, we have a couple of housing programs one uh directed for uh, women who have been uh, chronically homeless and then another rapid rehousing program for those who are um fleeing domestic violence so housing is kind of a big thing big thing for us and so that book i'm really excited about us just yeah, yeah housing is a really big thing and that book yes. is is great i think it'll be a really important piece and this is we're talking about housing. Um, do you mind like talking a little bit about housing as prevention and how it connects to your prevention work as well for folks? Like Absolutely. That. So um so I talked about our sexual assault response team. One of the most common needs we see is housing. So when we're meeting folks in the emergency rooms, housing is almost always an issue. Um, getting into shelter is often the challenge, especially with uh COVID and things this, like that. And um uh, really, there's just not enough shelter, <laughs> right? So, and not enough safe housing for folks. And so that is a, a huge piece of safety. That safety and stability is what we're looking for when we're empowering women here at the Y. And so housing is really, really important to us. Um, and it is one of those safety concerns that is huge on um, folks experiencing any kind of violence, right? So um, being unhoused automatically just puts you at a higher risk for experiencing violence. Definitely. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, it's been a little while since I've worked directly at a program, but that was always, always the experience of folks is housing, housing, yep. housing, housing. And I remember being on the calls, you know, we have really limited resources and someone's calling who maybe hasn't experienced violence yet, but they're unhoused. And I'm like, 
I know they need housing because this is going to put them in a risk for violence. But when we're in this tough position, I think a lot of times as advocates, because we're like, I can't offer person services yet because they haven't experienced violence yet. And that just really points at the very important part that prevention plays and yes, yeah. our goal of ending rape and abuse is that piece of ensuring people have safe places to go. Absolutely. Yeah. Always a always a fun and difficult topic to discuss around housing. Yes. Um, it's really amazing that programs like YWCA are so focused on housing because yes. of how important it is. And there's other programs in the St. Louis area as well as other areas that also do housing work. So definitely look into those programs if you're interested for folks who are on the live. Um, really important piece of work. And then I did want to talk about, and it was kind of back to the beginning of the conversation, but you mentioned health equity being an important piece of your racial equity challenge, the equity challenge that you all did, the 21 day challenge you did with the libraries after you kind of started working with them. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you kind of combined health equity in with the work you're doing and a little bit about what you can share with folks who are part of that challenge. Sure, absolutely. So um, a lot of things we looked at. So again, kind of taking, um, a historical walk right so you go kind of way back and talk about the disparities and um the mistreatment of particularly uh black or african-american folks by the medical systems right um so we talked about that but then we talked about more recently the numbers that we still see those disparities in. and in talking about um how those small conversations that we're having in this group do matter outside once you leave the 21 day challenge so um some people feel so they're learning things for the very first time right so I didn't know it was this bad and people get excited because I didn't know it was this bad and now I feel like I need to do something but I don't know what thing to do and a lot of people want to do something really big and impactful right away right because I just learned this thing and so I um we do need people to do really big things right but we also need people to do really small things and so I always uh, like to tell them about the small things and how much they matter and how much the conversation you have at dinner with your uncle does matter um, is your uncle a doctor is he working in these systems is, or is your aunt a teacher right are, are we teaching children of color and so those small conversations with folks do matter those folks leave out of there and go into the world and we'll more than likely work with people that don't look like them Definitely. And I really like that that's kind of the part you were talking about is those little conversations matter. Because I think where a lot of folks feel um, where their uncomfortability kind of comes in is I don't really want to assume things about other folks. So I don't want to assume that my uncle doesn't know about this stuff. But how even having that conversation can really start something important. And when we're scared to have conversations because it might be a little bit uncomfortable that we end up not being able to actually address these problems that we find are so important, or we get that fire lit under us to start doing something about. Um, and also important is to support work that's already going on. There are tons right. of organizations, community organizers, mutual aid funds who are doing a lot of this really direct on the ground work, and you don't have to do what they're already doing. You can support the work they're already doing. So that's something that I would also encourage folks on the call is looking for groups community organization, things like that, who are doing that work, because you can support what they're doing without having to. They're like, I don't know how to start a program myself. You don't have to. There are tons of that work already, and they need support from folks. So that's, those are big things people can do that I think don't realize they're big, because it's not like, right. I didn't write a grant for a million dollars. It's, you know, right. it's, I gave some money to this organization, or I talked to my cousin about this, you right. know. You know, or I'm help my neighbor. Like, that's things that we already, I think, do in our society, in our culture, where sure can be very community oriented in some ways. And so supporting your community can really be just that, supporting your neighbors, supporting the organizations in your community, things like yeah. that. Absolutely. Reminding folks that, you know, systems of oppression weren't built in a day, nor will they be dismantled in a day. And so it's a long, it's a long fight, right? <laughs> we're in the, we're in the long, it's the, the yep. long game, the marathon, um, right but we can have a little short sprints. And I think that's something that I'm encouraged, I've been encouraged about even as the world is a really tough place right now, it seems to be getting more and more difficult for a lot of folks, um, a lot of things going on. But I think I'm encouraged by seeing how many people who are, this is the first time or the first few years, the first time they've been like, I didn't even realize these things were happening. And being able to be have that fire lit out of them because that's such an important thing too in keeping momentum for these movements, momentum for prevention work, momentum for ending domestic and sexual violence, does require people who are new to it, whether it's because they're younger and they, you know, just born, or it's because they are new to understanding and learning these things. And so I love opportunities like the Social Justice Book Club 
for anyone to be able to learn about these things and be a part of it. Absolutely. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, if there's anything else you want to add, Angela, go for it. And then we're going to wrap up after that. So Absolutely. So I've got one more little small step folks can take that I'm going to share with you. So uh, the YWCA USA, so our national um, organization, every year, the end of April, does a Stand Against Racism. Um, and so we are ramping up for that right now. The Stand Against Racism theme this year is We Can't Wait, Equity and Justice Now. Um, so a really quick, easy, small step folks can take is really going to standagainstracism.org organ signing the pledge so and then there's some social media graphics folks can share again small steps make big change that is fantastic angela thank you and i will get the link from you after the call and i'll add it on facebook so for folks who are watching this whether it's live or um, after we'll have that in the comments so anybody can both look at ywca's opportunities the book club and also the stand against racism petition so awesome. And I also, I love that the title is like a bit perfectly with what we were talking about of like the right. time is now. That is perfect mind meld of things of our conversation and that going well together. So for any folks who are on the live um, still and you have questions and we don't get to them because we don't see them, we will, um, I'll communicate with you or you're welcome to come uh, call us, email us, all the things. Um, so thank you for joining us. The live event is being recorded as a reminder and we're uploaded to our YouTube channel and also as a podcast and that can be wherever you get podcasts. And as a quick reminder, moving forward, live events are every last Friday of the month. So look forward to our one in March. Um, and we're also just super excited to have lots of folks on, have a new format. And thank you so much, Angela, for being on this call. Um, Angela, we've been trying to get Angela on with our old host, Matthew. So I feel very lucky that I got to have her on as my second. Nice. <laughs> so thank you so much, Angela. Thank you.